Luke Leifrau, glad you're with us. We're East Coast Church here on Skyline Lakes Fire Department in Ringwood, New Jersey. We're every Sunday at 10 o'clock. If you're in there, we'd love to see you here. We're continuing our series concerning the healing anointing of God. And today we want to talk about how to receive your healing, how to tap into the healing flow. Last week in service, for those that, that, that were here physically, we saw a great move of God after the service as we prayed for people to be healed. And we saw tremendous results. Uh, we had people on this side of the room. Pastor Kim prayed for. I prayed people on this side of the room. And we saw great results out of having learned about healing and then releasing the anointing to heal. And we're really going to see more of that today. Yes. So we're going to talk about how to receive your healing today. Matthew 14, verses 34 and 36. When they had gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him. Everybody say, had knowledge. Had knowledge. When they had knowledge of Jesus, they sent out into all that country, ran about, and brought unto him all that were diseased. Everybody say, all. Oh. Anybody sick was brought to him. And they besought him that he might, that they might touch the hem of his garment, as many touched were made perfectly whole. And we talked about this one last week in coordination with three other faith cases in the Bible. It said, for some reason, Jesus... And the, and the Word of God, Paul, as well, where the anointing can be transferable and transferred on cloth. We see the cloth here with the woman's issue blood. We see it here. We see it with Paul on the handkerchiefs and aprons. So notice three things here. They had knowledge of him. They heard about him. They brought in him all that were diseased, and they touched his clothes. They were made whole. They noticed that the first thing they had to do first was have knowledge of him. You see that? They had to hear the Word of God first before anything happened. They heard first. And because they heard, their faith grew. Because we know in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So if you hear the word of God first, your faith will then increase, and then you're in a position to receive from God. Does that make sense? That's why when I'm ever when I was traveling and preaching and, and now as a pastor, if we're gonna believe God for healing, I'd rather speak on healing first and then minister later. Unless the Holy Spirit just moves. I've had the times when during worship, the Holy Spirit would move and speak to me and say, heal now. Mm-hmm. And you step right out into it and you see the results of it. And but other than that, it's, it's, you get you normally better results when you hear the word first and then step into the flow to receive the healing itself. But the hearing most of the time comes first. This is God's way. Jesus showed it to us an example, was an example to us as well. So the question comes in, if this is God's way to heal and hear the word of God first, what are we hearing? Are we hearing the world first or are we hearing the word of God first? If you need healing your body, you want to hear the word of God first. Like right now for Kristen, who we find out now is pregnant with a baby. You know, for her and Nick, as they start speaking God's word over this baby now, that this baby will be peaceful, will be kind, will be considerate, will be loving. You start speaking there with the child before the child's even birth, and that child is birth, guess what the child is going to be? Those things that are spoken over. And so you can you can literally alter the future of a person by what you speak and what you hear. Luke 6, 17, he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples, a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and and Sidon, who came to hear him. They came to do what? Hear him. They had heard about him. Now he's in person in their area, and they want to hear him and be healed of their diseases. They came to hear and to be healed. They heard first, and they were healed. People today want to be healed. But the problem is they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. As a pastor, I see that in people's lives at times, the people who aren't hungry, and uh, they quit coming to church, and you watch their lives from a distance, and their lives start getting messed up, and they start getting screwed up because they won't want to hear the word. And they make excuses for not coming. And... Uh, and when you see that, you see your life just dissipating. You say, no, wake up. Look at your life. It's going backwards. But when you're in the midst of it, sometimes you can't see it. And we want to be healed. We want to be delivered. Um, if we want that, we, we, want, we should want to hear from God. The biggest reason people are not healed is because they don't, they don't hear. They don't want to hear. All right? And we've got to get past that. I've said this a couple of weeks ago. It came up in my spirit today as I was preparing the other day for this. You cannot cherry pick the Bible. You can't pull this verse out and say, I believe this one, but I won't believe this one. 
I had somebody on Facebook the other day, a friend of mine, someone responded to him. He put something on there about some scriptures. And somebody responded to him and said, uh, verses 8 and 9 are fine, but verse 8 and 9 can cancels verse 10. And I just couldn't help myself. I went and replied to that person and said, nobody cancels any verse of the Bible, period. And guess what? It shut up the conversation. That person didn't respond to that at all. Verse, two verses in the Bible don't cancel a third verse in the Bible. A third verse in the Bible. It's the whole counsel of God. Are you hearing me? And so we have to understand, you can't cherry pick. Well, I believe this part of the Bible, not this. You do that, your life's going to be a mess. You accept it as a whole counsel of God or not. And you know that the old is fulfilled in the new. We should spend more time in the new than the old. But it is the whole counsel of God. And we need the whole counsel of God. You must believe everything the Bible says, obey it, and act on it by faith to get the benefits from it. You can know what the Bible says and disobey it, not act by in faith, and you don't get the benefit. But when you know what it says, and sometimes there's people, all of us are growing. There's times that I look back when I didn't know what the Bible said about salvation or healing or deliverance or rest. I didn't know of that. But I, I started reading the Bible, and then I learned. God started teaching me about it. So once you, as you learn it, if you obey it, you'll get the benefit of that. Mark 6, 5 says, Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. This is a talk about when Jesus went back into his hometown. And the people, we'll see in a few minutes, we'll get into more of the scriptures later about this. But even he was to a point that he couldn't do the miracles he wanted to do because of people's unbelief. And if Jesus had his ministry, his healing ministry stopped, because of unbelief, we can too. He did lay hands on a few sick people and he healed them. That tells you there was a few people there who had faith, but most of them didn't. And we'll see why later. Even Jesus could not help unbelieving people. Those he did help had faith. Now, the anointing to heal works two ways. It can work on an individual, or it can work on a corporate basis or on a mass of people. It can heal one, it can heal many. There was a great missionary uh, named T.L. Osborne, who's now going to be a lord. How many of you ever heard of T.L. Osborne? A few of you. Most of you haven't. Great man. He's married to uh, LaDonna Osborne's wife. Great woman of God. They went overseas and held crusades when it wasn't popular. It went to the hard places of the earth. When openly declared that Jesus Christ is alive, he's a son of God, and he heals. And one day as he was doing that, uh, the Lord asked him a question. He said, T.L., can I heal one person at a time? And T.L. said, yes, you can. He said, could I heal two people at the same time? Yes, sir, you could. Could I heal 10 at the same time? Yes, sir. He went on, 50, yes, sir, 100, yes, sir, 1,000, yes, sir, 25,000 at one time. Yes, sir. How about 100,000 people getting healed at one time? Yes. Then why don't you start speaking to all the people to be healed with one prayer? And T.L. said, I've never had that thought before. I, on, the, on this platform, on the Crusades, I always I would pray individual prayers for people as they came forward, and the place would be jam-packed. And then we got sore. If there's a wave of people came forward, we learned we had to have space between them and us, we thought, you know, between the platform and them. But this wave of people, 100,000 people start coming to the front. We start seeing the front people being crushed and being trampled on. We didn't have people die. He said, that's not good. So we learned we had to fill the gap between the platform and the people with people. And then come all the way to the platform. So that way there wouldn't be a way pushing to the platform that would hurt people. He said, then I learned I could pray for everybody with one prayer. And God would heal all of them. There was a man one time he talked about who was chained to a tree in the very, very back behind everybody. He was demonic, demonically possessed. And as T.L. prayed, the devils came out. He's in his right mind, standing praising God. They ended the chains, and he accepted Jesus. Off in one prayer. So you see the healing money can work for an individual or it can work for groups of people at the same time. Luke 8, 18. Therefore take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. What you hear either increases your faith or decreases your faith. There's too much stuff in social media decreasing people's faith. 
that's so when I start seeing things and I, I sense the Holy Spirit say respond to it, I'll respond just so that God has a place for people to think differently. So take heed how you hear, for whoever has to him more will be given. That means whoever takes heed to the anointing to heal, you get more anointing to heal. If you take heed what the Bible says about giving, then you're, you're going to receive more. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. You don't hear this preached much in Word of Faith churches, but I preached it for years. That if you start disobeying the Word of God, what you have will be taken from you. Why? If it opens the door to Satan to come in to steal, to kill, and to destroy, he'll come steal from you. You'll open that door up and you start disobeying God's Word. Faith brings God's blessings to you. Unbelief takes the blessings away from you. It's that simple. Obedience is rewarded. Disobedience, disobedience puts you in a position that the enemy can steal from you. It's your choice. And at the very bottom put, when you cooperate with the anointing, you cooperate with the anointing with your faith. The anointing is the presence and power of God. You cooperate with the anointing by using your faith. Faith activates the power of God. Faith activates God's power. You want God's power in your faith in your life, you have to activate your faith. When ministering healing to people and you're ministering, say you're praying for somebody else to be healed away from here. You can sense when the power of God has gone into their body. So when I'm praying for people to be healed, if I sense the power of God has gone inside their body, then I know it has started. The healing process has started. And I don't have to see it fully manifest in my presence. I know it's going in their body and it has started. And if it is in their body and has started, then God will complete what he has started. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. If it didn't go into their body, I've had that happen. Or I prayed and nothing happened. I could sense no power going into their body. I'll pray a second time until it does. And if it doesn't, then I'll, I'll start talking to them and see what they're believing because their faith, their lack of faith may be blocking that anointing from coming into their body. Believing is receiving. Receiving is believing. If there's no receiving, there's no believing. It's that simple. It's that simple. People want to see what the minister can do. And this is where people get screwed up. Instead of believing God. People, I mean, I've sat in the congregation where you sit, where you are seated today. I've heard my pastor speak for years, and I've been in other meetings where I wasn't speaking. And uh, and I, I've heard people say, sitting right next to me, well, I need to be healed, but I'll just see how much knowing this, this, this preacher has. Putting all the responsibility, they're healing on the preacher. And guess what? They came back not being healed. Well, he didn't have nothing on him. No, you didn't believe. Are you hearing me? We don't gauge our healing based on the anointing that's on the speaker. The healing is based on the word of God and whether we agree with God's word. If we agree with it, then we don't even need anybody to pray for us. We can receive it on our own between us and God. And that's a great thing. You don't have to go find some preacher to be healed. You take the word of God yourself, apply it to your life, and be healed from it. Wouldn't that be horrible? Think about this for a minute. It would be horrible if, if you, in order for you to be healed at East Coast Church here in Ringwood, New Jersey, if you had to have me pray for you, for you to be healed, wouldn't it be horrible? Because what if I wasn't available? You couldn't be healed if that was the case, right? That would be horrible. And God knew that. So I, I learned this a long time ago when I was a baby Christian. God told me this one day. that it changed my life because I failed to witness to somebody, and I beat myself up over it. Guys, how I screwed up. God gave this great opportunity, laid the foundation. All I had to do is lead this guy to the Lord. And I didn't do it. And I was so broken hearted. And, and he, he taught me something that really helped me. He said, Jerry, remember this and never forget it. I never put any one person's salvation or healing in the hands of one man or one woman. I said, you don't? He said, no. I knew you were going to screw it up. I knew you wasn't going to present salvation to this person. But I still gave you the opportunity. And now you're, you're going to grow from it. And next time you won't miss the opportunity. You'll miss some others in your life, but I'm gracious enough to still give you the opportunity because I want you to grow. And that took a lot of pressure off of me, knowing that my obedience or disobedience was not going to doom somebody forever. Are you hearing me? Yeah. That when I screw it up, God will send somebody else that won't screw it up to make my screw up not even be known. 
And that took, again, like I said, a lot of pressure off of me. That helped me. And I think that helps all of us to know that. We have to learn to believe God for ourselves. You can pull, I've learned this years, you can pull the anointing, particularly the anointing to heal out of somebody, a minister, a member of the body of Christ, your husband, your wife. You can literally pull that out. I, I went to, used to go to church when I traveled, and we'd sometime announce ahead of time what we were speaking on because the pastor would want something done a certain way, a center of healing. And he, get, he spent a month getting that congregation ready to receive me as a minister gift. And when I came in, people were excited, expectant, and we knew we'd see miracles. And uh, we want that here at East Coast Church as well. But literally, when I don't walk in the service, it was so easy to preach. I couldn't wait to get done preaching to get to the good, what I call the good stuff. Seeing people saved, healed, supernaturally delivered and restored by the word of God, by the power of God, because they were ready. And they anticipated, they were expecting, and that's where you saw miracles. And we want that this place to be like that. That when we come, we're expecting to walk out here different, to receive the miracle we need in our life as well. Remember, faith activates the power of God. When you make a demand on God's healing power by using your faith in God's anointing. There's also, uh, we'll get, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to throw this in here. There's also, there's also called a fire. The Bible talks about the fire of the Holy Ghost. And, and, and this is a, a place in the anointing, and you get further and further into it where the fire of God falls. And later, weeks from now, we'll look like spend uh, you know, a, a week, a week on, on the fire of God. But I experienced it years ago in Kansas City, and I was saved, but I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't speak in tongues. And Brother Copeland was there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And he's, so, you know, morning, afternoon, and night. And he always announced this meeting Saturday, Saturday night was always what they call Holy Ghost night for people to be baptized in the Holy Ghost speak and they just speak no tongues. I knew nothing about it. And, but I had to start learning about it and desired it. And so I, as the more he spoke about it, the more I was looking forward to Saturday night. I wanted to be one of those people that received my prayer language. Got, by, got, got baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I was really expecting. So he got to that point in service. He said, if you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, speak in the tongues, please stand. And I stood up. And a lot of people did in that room. And he had the people around us. He said, now, those of you that are around these people that you already have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. I want you to stand up around them and just lay your hands on them. I'll pray one prayer, and you can pray as well over them. But just lay your hands on their shoulder or their forehead. And uh, the lady in front of me, she turned around. And she started to put towards us. My eyes were wide open at that moment. Mm -hmm. She started putting her hands towards my forehead, and she never touched my forehead. And... It was up a bowl of electricity went out of her hand into my head went all the way down to my toes. It's like I was being shocked electrically by the Spirit of God. And I instantly started speaking in tongues. People around us said they saw what they said was a bolt of lightning come out of her hand into my head. I didn't see the bolt, but I felt it. Are you hearing me? And that's part of the fire of God. And to get to the fire of God, you've got to do some things in the anointing with the anointing to get there. But if you do, you can experience that as well. Now, we want that as well in the days ahead. How many of you have ever seen someone being prayed for that fell under the power of God? Yeah. I don't like use they used to use the word slain the spirit. I don't like that. I didn't slain anybody. It's just it's where the some praise for you, the presence of God gets so strong that your body can't take it physically and you, you can't stand up and fall. I was talking about for the service with Joe over here. Talk about times we used to get be pinned to the floor. I just call it kissing the carpet. We couldn't get up. Uh, we've not had that a lot here, but I uh, had it a little bit. Uh, one day I was walking by, uh, Arthur was sitting back here, and I walked, I walked by him, and the anointing came on really strong. I was walking by him, didn't touch him, didn't pray for him, just walked by him. He, he told me later, he said, I almost fell off my feet when you walked by. I said, Oh, really? He said, Well, I said, What happened? He said, You walked by, there was a presence of it goes on you that came on me. And he, he said, physically, I got weak, and I felt like I was going to fall, so I sat down. I said, Arthur, that's the power of God working on you. You know, about praying and prayed for without anybody talking to him. There's that anointing being transferred one person to another. See, back in 1952 was really when people started falling into the power of God. You can trace it back to about 1952. And I can remember... Uh, I remember a girl in Colby, Kansas. I was preaching her in this church out in the middle of nowhere. And there was a, a home for ch uh, girls out there, abandoned girls. And they all came to that service. There was like 20 of them that came. And we got done preaching. And 
started praying for him and no one was there to catch him. They had no catchers. And so they started falling under the power of God. Just, now, the floor in this old church was an old hard oak floor, wood floor. It's, it's oak, so it's a hardwood. Mm -hmm. And as they would fall, they fell like feathers. They, you didn't hear any thuds. And this, by the middle of the, of the group of women I was praying for, uh, I started laying my hands on this one girl. I never even touched her. She fell in the power of God. And he didn't, didn't, hear, didn't hear her head hit anything. It didn't make no sound. And I looked at her, and at the bottom, her head was underneath the bottom of a pew, and where the pew was, there was a, a an L-shaped brace that had a screw in it. And over the years, that L, right where the L was, the corner had turned into a point. It's like a pencil, a piece of pencil that's coming straight, a piece of steel coming straight out that it had worn itself that to that way. Her head came within a millimeter of that, and never touched it. I've always said, if you take the catchers away, you see what's really God and what isn't God in churches. I had people just would fall just to fall. Had a lady one time fell, and then she hurt herself. Hurt her back. I looked at her, and I said, are you going to quit messing with God? In front of about 500 people. She said, what? I said, you fell on purpose, and now you're hurt. You hurt your back. How dare you? How dare you try to fall and look like you're doing something? God's not impressed. I'm not impressed. You need to, you need to apologize to God. You're gonna have a bad back for a while. But if you'll if you'll apologize to Him and get right with God, I'll pray for you. And your back will be healed. But if you don't, you're gonna walk out of here not being able to walk with a bad back. Which one you want to do? She said, "Somebody help me up. I'll, I'll apologize." I said, "No, you apologize on the floor. Nope, you do it right there." I'm going to put the microphone in your face and you, and you say what you need to say. Mm. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? No. no. She's messing with God. Mm. Put the microphone in her face. She apologized to God, asking for him to forgive her, to the pastor, to all the people. I said, you ready? She said, yep. Yeah. Usher helped her up. Prayed for her. She was instantly healed. I said, don't you ever do that again. So then the other people we got ready to pray for, I had two or three of them get out of line. Why? Because they were messing with God. They wanted to go up there and fall. They didn't need to be healed or anything. They were just messing. Are you hearing me? So when this started happening in people in certain church services, or people started falling, some people got into that. Thought, well, that'd be nice to do. I'll just, I'll just fall. I'd never fallen on my own before God, but I've had God knock me on my feet. And one time in a service, uh, more surreal spoke to me as he did. Uh, the power of God came on me and. and they, I didn't know this, so I saw it later in the video. I went up before I went down, and I was 50 pounds heavier then than I am now. And they said when I landed, there was no thud. I landed like a feather. And everybody thought when they saw me go up, thought, how's this big guy going to land without hurting himself? When it's the power of God, there's no need for catchers. You won't get hurt. Are you hearing me? So you have to understand, the things that God not be played with, when you see things like this happen, there's a reason for it. And when someone like this, when the power of God overcomes you and they say it knocks you to the floor, uh, when you get up, you're going to be healed if you need to be healed. Whatever you need is going to happen there on the floor. You only get an instruction. I've even had God speak to me being pinned to the floor where I couldn't move my body. He started talking about my future. And now, I'm going to talk to a couple illustrations here to show you the dimension of the spirit. All right? And... I'm not saying we're looking for this, but I'm going to show you what's possible. Uh, Brother Hagen, Kenneth e. Hagen, one of the greatest prophets there ever was off the earth. He's the one that has made a Bible training center, what it was. He's, he taught his mandate from God was to teach my people faith, so he's a faith teacher. He was he pastored before he ever traveled in ministry. And as he started traveling, he went to his church, his country church, and they came in to to start praying before the services. He was there four or five days. And they started praying. And this one young man, uh, he came in with about 20 other people, and they were praying uh, before the service. And as the service started, instead of starting to praise and worship, the pastor just felt that, uh, I want everybody to just keep praying, and those of us who've come in now, we're going to start this service off by prayer. We're just going to pray. And so this one young man who, didn't, who was there earlier, he just kept praying. He got up. There was an altar rail back in that church. And he got up on the altar rail and started walking on it and praying. 
with his eyes closed. And Brother Egg says, as the most marvelous thing we watch, he'd have his eyes shut. He'd walk to the very end of that altar rail, which is four feet off the ground. He'd get to, get to the very end of it and turn around and start the other way without open his eyes. He will clear down the other one and get to where he's ready to fall off the thing and turn around and go the other way. He said he did this for about five minutes. He said, I said, I'm not closing my eyes. I'm watching this kid. And he said, five minutes later, this kid kept going back and forth doing that. And then, and then he said, I would never would have believed it if I had seen my own eyes. He said, he walked to the end of that rail and kept walking in thin air. He walked 10 feet, turned around, and walked back in thin air and back to the rail. He said, then I understood. There's dimensions of God that we never see or get to because we're not willing to pay the price it takes to get there. And this kid was willing to pay the price. And that was a manifestation of God to reward this young man for having a heart towards him. Imagine that. Imagine that happened today in today's world in a church. With all the cameras running. What that would look like. Be awesome, wouldn't it? See, there's dimensions God we hadn't thought about. And I think it's time for us to start thinking about those dimensions. God was not anointed with virtue, he was anointed with power. Everybody say power. Power. Mark 5.30, Jesus said, he immediately anointed himself that power had gone out of him. He turned around the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? This word power in the Greek is the word dunamis. It's where we get our word dynamite from. So we ever see the word power in the Bible in the New Testament in the Greek. The Greek word is dunamis, which means dynamite, explosive power. The one the issue of blood touched his garments in faith and was healed by many others to Jesus in the crowd, and none of them were healed. You ever think about that? All the crowd around Jesus when the one the issue of blood came, they were touching him as well, and none of them did the power of God come out of why? They didn't need to be healed. They didn't want to be healed. But with her, she needed to be. She wanted to be. And when she touched, the power came out. So what's that show us? Some people had no faith to be healed. She had both faith and then actions that proved that if she touched, she was healed. I put her at the bottom. So the power did not flow with Jesus because someone touched him. It flowed up because someone with faith touched him, expecting to be healed. You see that? This is important. The power did not flow out of Jesus because someone touched him. It flowed because someone with faith touched him, expecting to be healed. What you expect, you're going to have happen to you, good or bad. One individual can technically known by faith, a whole crowd can. I mean, I saw this in Russia. There's one service in Russia, Artis Hines, six foot seven, African American man, weighed about 325 pounds. When we got done, Pastor Bill Joe got done preaching in St. Petersburg. In the, we were in the Olympic arena that was built in the 1980 Olympics that the world boycotted it. No one went to. And uh, so we're in this huge arena built for the Olympics, having our meetings there after the coup had happened. And uh, Bill Joe had done preaching. We go down to the staff that were with him, and we just go down and pray for people. An artist, like I said, he's six foot seven, 325 pounds, African American. I mean, he stood out. And they bring him a person that's deaf and dumb. He prays a 10 second prayer, and guess what? They can hear and they can speak perfectly. Here came another one. And before long, he had a line of 30 deaf and dumb people, and every one of them were healed. And I saw the first two. I went, whoa, something's going on tonight. They brought me somebody who couldn't hear, and I said, go over there. <laughs> I'm smart to know. He's getting everybody who can't hear can't speak, healed, you're going over there. They looked at me and said, nope, go get in that line over there. They brought me somebody else who was crippled. First one I ever laid hands on, he immediately healed. And they started with, and the Russian people would come and watch. They'd gather around the one person you're praying for. There'd be hunters watching. And you tell them, Jesus is a healer. He's going to heal you now. What's wrong? The interpreter would tell you. And then you'd lay your hands and pray, and they'd be healed like that. And when they saw the healing work, they run and get either back in line for themselves or go get their loved one who need healing and bring them in line. And that night I prayed over 100 people and every person was healed. Every single one was healed. And I got to the very last one. They brought me a young man. Some of you have heard of this. Have he was all crippled up. He could shuffle. His legs were twisted. He just shuffled. His arms were doing this. And he couldn't speak. He just went, oh, oh. He grunted. 
And so I asked his mom was with him, and so I asked his mom to interpret, what's wrong with him? And she said, can't you see? I said, what's wrong with him? How long has he been this way? Been this way since his birth. And I looked at her and I said, do you believe that Jesus can heal him? Yes, that's why we're here. He's healed everybody before us. We, I know he, he, he can heal my son. I laid my hands on him and prayed. And I sensed a little bit of the healing power of God going to him, but not much, like I had to do with all these other people. And I stepped back. The only thing that was different, he still grunted. <laughs> his legs, he just shuffled a little bit. But his arms that were doing this are now doing this. It, it slowed down. There had been a change. And I walked away from him. You know, the hand car got, got into his body, not even thinking, I turned around, and I said to him, the next time I see you, you'll be totally healed. And then walked away, got on the bus and left. So I was leaving to get on the bus. It hit me. I said the next time I see him, he'll be totally healed. That means I'm coming back. That was the very first meeting we'd had that November in St. Petersburg. I, I, I knew I was supposed to go in January. So I told the guy who did the, the getting the crusade ready for January, I'm going in January. And when I go on a mission trip, I don't put my own money in the trip. I believe God for the money. If the money doesn't come in, I don't go. I'm not going to deprive my family of finances to go to the mission field or do ministry. I believe God for the money. And if it doesn't come in, I mean, God doesn't mean to go at that moment. And so I needed, I don't know, $1,800, whatever it was, all but 30 bucks didn't come in. I hit 30 bucks. I said, nope. My wife said, what are you going to do? I said, unless it comes in, I'm not going. The deadline came and passed. The leader came to me, are you going? I said, nope. So why not? I said, I'm 30 bucks short. So said, I'll give you 30 bucks. I said, no. Either God brings it sovereignly or I'm not going. I'm not supposed to go. The money never came in. I didn't go. As soon as they left for the crusade, as soon as they left, God gave me $30. And I went, really? <laughs> He said, really? So I'm going to go in February. He said, yes. I said, okay. So I told my wife I'm going in February. They got back, heard all the testimonies, and man, I was, I was not happy. I was happy to testimony, but I had an idea to get to see him. So I go in February, right? I'm preparing on Tuesday. We fly in, you know, we leave on Monday. We're, it's a long flight. Guy, he'll go to Helsinki and then into St. Petersburg. And, Get there Tuesday, we're fine, or Monday night. I get there in the meeting room for Tuesday for the afternoon meeting, and I'm doing some stuff. And someone taps me on the shoulder. And I turn around, his arms go around my neck, squeezing my neck. Now, I'm not a little guy, and I couldn't breathe. I tried to get my fingers between his hands and my neck, and I couldn't get them there. And he kept, I started getting fainting. I don't faint. I finally kept crying. I find out my my one hand between between his hand his hand and my throat. I could breathe, thank God. And I turned around to see who this was. And this young man had on a plaid coat, had a had on a name tag. He's ushering, helping us with the meeting. His legs are perfectly straight. His arms are perfectly straight. He looked at me and did this: Jesus, Jesus, Jerry. And I went, what? He went, Jesus, Jesus, Jerry. Jesus saved him. Jesus healed him. But Jesus sent Jerry to bring him. And we both started crying. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't hug him and hold the tears back. We just grabbed and hugged him and, and just hugged, 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 hugged and cried. And that whole week, he ushered every single service. Mm -hmm. And today, it's still whole. That's what the healing anointing will do. Isn't that amazing? One of the greatest miracles of my life of measuring healing somebody, I didn't, I would not have, I, I asked, I, asked, I said, Lord, now I see why I couldn't come in January. I said, I wanted to ask you, make sure, why didn't I come in January? And he said, his healing wasn't completed yet. I wanted you to see the finished product. I didn't want you to see something not done yet. That's why you didn't come. I wanted you to see the finished product. Imagine that. We're going to see those type of things here in the days ahead. We're going to see those type of miracles here in the days ahead. See, one individual can tap into a healing anointing. A whole crowd can. It's amazing. 
Now I want to say something to you. And we're going to take this moment to have a testimony. You cannot believe beyond actual knowledge. You cannot believe beyond actual knowledge. If you don't have knowledge of something from the Bible, you can't believe for it. So you have no knowledge of it. For instance, if you've never seen a red apple in your life, you've never seen the color red, and you've never seen an apple, then you have no knowledge about a red apple. To you, it doesn't exist until you see it for the first time, until you have knowledge of it. Understand? Mm -hmm. That's why people aren't healed. They have no knowledge of God's healing power. Mm -hmm. And they can't believe by faith for something they don't have knowledge about. Mm -hmm. But when you know that God, number one, is a good God, yeah. he's not only the Savior, but he's the healer. Mm -hmm. Keep it in the line. When he's the provider, there's people in the church, in the body of Christ, that have lack because they understand God is their provider. And when they get to a point that they can't provide for themselves, they don't know what to do. Because they don't understand how the kingdom of God works financially. That when you give, God gives back to you. So in every realm of God, you can't believe beyond natural knowledge. And that's why so many people miss it or not heal. They try to believe beyond the actual knowledge that they have. And it never works that way. Now listen to this. Never forget this. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Never forget that. Faith begins where the will of God is known. What is the will of God concerning healing? It's to heal people, right? It's to be healed. So faith begins, it starts where the will of God is known. So when you know what the Bible says about healing, that's where your faith can start to believe God to be healed. Anthony, come on up here. We were praying last week for you know, both sides of the room and had so many people who were healed. And uh, Anthony experienced it himself in his shoulder. And so as he comes, I, I asked him if he would be willing to testify this morning. What are your shoulders like before we prayed for him and what it was like after we prayed for him? So, Anthony, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Hi. So, like he was saying earlier, believing is, is seeing. And prior to me coming here, I was very, I wasn't on the best terms of, with God. And experiencing all these miracles and stuff, it really is something remarkable, but it's something that you have to believe in. You know, every single time I come here, I always hear something that I just can't believe that he's witness. And sometimes I have a little thing in my head that tells me maybe that didn't happen. Like, how could that happen? And that's just the devil trying to tell me that it's false, but it's not false. Prior to Pastor Kim putting hands on me, my shoulder was in a bad spot. I had really banged up clicking noises and it was just starting to deteriorate also after all the wear and tear of my rounds with Nick at the gym. <laughs> but after a while, I remember Chrissy, your knee, your knee was feeling better and well, your knee was feeling better. And I walked away because I was just, you know, something was going on, but I didn't understand what was happening. And then as I was having a conversation with Joe and I was having a conversation with Kelly, I started moving my arm around. I'm just like, Ooh what the heck is going on? And then I'm saying to myself, I was just like, did something just happen? And this is me trying to combat myself thinking it wasn't real, but it was very real what happened. And what happened was hands were placed on me from people that truly believe that Lord, that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And those blessings were then put onto me and then helped heal my shoulder. So I love coming here and I love experiencing the miracles and Everything else that comes, I'm all here for it. Amen. 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 Now, unbelief will stop the power of God. Never forget this. Unbelief can stop the power of God. One thing I will say, Anthony, uh, now you got to take it easy on Nick. He's a future father, so don't be him up to that anymore. You got to take it easy on me. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Let's look at Mark 6, the first six verses. Then Jesus went out there, went out from there and came to his own country. He came to his own what? Country. So he went to see, he went to where, to where he was known. His disciples followed him. When the Sabbath would come, he began to teach in the synagogue. So this is what he's used to doing. Many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What wisdom is this which is given to him? You almost hear him say, not us. 
that such mighty works were performed by his hands. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother James, Moses, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So they were saying, why would God be someone like this? And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And goes up there and says, then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Jesus could not heal many because of their unbelief. And they could not believe that one of their own could be used by God this way. A few did, a few believed, and they were healed. If unbelief stopped Jesus, it can stop us. This is why we preach first if we can, and then heal second. We want people's faith to rise up so they can receive from God. Even with your neighbors, your friends, people at work, uh, always speak the word to them first before you pray for them to be healed. You usually get better results. This applies to every realm we walk in. Every realm we walk in. You want to, you want to see God move in relationships? Stay with the Bible says about relationships and then move in that. There's a close connection between now listen to this. There's a close connection between what God what Jesus said and receiving healing from him. A very close connection. What Jesus says and to receive healing from him. We tell people that God had told us, either through his word or what he speaks to us instantly. I can remember a girl in Russia. Again, I'm in a high school and preaching from the, a message from the, the uh, platform, the auditorium. And, uh, and I had people go over there with me, about 30 people. I certainly had hands on people before I prayed. And there was a girl crying in the back by the door. And I looked at her and I said to her, in the name of Jesus, lump be removed off that breast now, in Jesus' name. And she later testified, as soon as I said that, the power of God came on her. And, and almost to a point, she couldn't stand up. And then this thought came to her, go to the bathroom and check my breast. And she did. And the lump was gone. It was cancerous. She'd been, she'd been given a few months to live. And went back, no cancer. And removed just in a moment, like that. See? And so when we see things like that, we understand that in Jesus' ministry, there's some people that did receive they didn't believe, but they didn't get them to believe and hear the teaching, hear the preaching, then the chances are that people will be healed, can be healed. Now, Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. This is important. You remember in the in the New Testament where we go over to Luke 4 and we see this Jesus standing up and, and talking about speaking this in Luke 4, 18? This is what he was speaking of. He was quoting Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal. Everybody say heal. heal. The brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and open the prison of those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. Jesus probably preached this everywhere he went. He probably started with this. This was direct. It brought faith. Or unbelief up to the surface of the people that came to see him. And I believe, you yeah, remember, he didn't have the New Testament like we do, because he hadn't died yet and gone to heaven. The New Testament wasn't even written yet. So for him to read this, I have a feeling every time he got up, he probably read this scripture. Brother Hagen, who I taught, told you about taught on faith. Faith, almost every time he started a service, he'd read Mark 11, 22 through 26. It's the greatest faith passage there is in the Bible. And uh, he, he wore his word out. Uh, he always said people don't get it the first time. He kept repeating himself, repeating himself. There's those scriptures. Later people claimed he wrote those scriptures. <laughs> he kept talking about them so much, but he didn't. Uh, of course, Mark did. So Jesus probably preached this everywhere he went first, and he was direct with it. Luke 4.28, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They rose up and thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill, which the city was built on, and they might throw him down over the cliff. One place says, the translator says, they'll throw him down head first. They took him out and kill him. You think that's faith or unbelief? That's unbelief, right? They thought, there's no, they think like he was a heresy, a false prophet, they're going out and kill him. And the Bible later tells us he walked right through the midst of him. They took him out and killed him, he just walked away from him. They couldn't lay a hand on him. That had to infuriate them. They got mad 
which means they were filled with unbelief. Being angry nullifies your faith. Being angry will nullify your faith. That's why if people have a short fuse, be a very leery of that short fuse. You can lengthen that fuse with what the Word of God. Because if you have a quick temper, as soon as that thing kicks in, you've lost your faith. And you've gone from believing to unbelief, just like that. Angry people have no faith at that moment. You sabotage your faith when you get angry. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do? You learn not to get angry, mm -hmm. not to be offended. Jesus said, do not be offended. If you stay clear of those things, then you can see the power of God work through you. Jesus run out of town. People will think sometimes that you're nuts because you believe in healing. You believe in a God that's alive and well. I remember Anthony telling me at times some of his friends can't believe he's going to church. Why would you go to church? He told me, you know, months ago. And then he tells him why. But people are going to think we're nuts at times for believing this stuff. We believe it because he's alive and because it works. They did not accept his message and they didn't accept him as a healer. The faith of the crowd can help or hinder the anointing to heal. Get the unbelief out of the room if, you're, if you have that and you're missing minister of people. I've had I've gone to hospital rooms where the whole family's there and someone's dying, and I've had to chase the whole family out of the room, except for me, close the door, and then pray. Why? Because they all didn't believe in Jesus, they didn't believe in him and the healer. I just asked them they'd step outside, that's some time with their loved one, and they never had refused me. And then I prayed and seen them raise up off deathbeds. If you're dying in the hospital, if I'm dying on the hospital bed, don't bring a bunch of unbelievers in my room. I will tell her, keep them out. Bring in faith-filled people, preach the word to me, pray for me, and I'll be raised up. I'll believe. Are you hearing me? Your faith determines your outcome. The crowd can pull miracles out of the minister or it can stop the flow of God. The crowd can pull the miracles out of you or it can stop them. You're the faith. Your faith determines your outcome. I like that. Your faith doesn't determine my outcome. My faith determines my outcome. And then I'm in control of my future because I'm in control of my faith. Are you hearing me? I would have had my hands on it to be in control of it than somebody else that I had to rely on. Make sense? Mark 5, 35 36, he was still speaking. Some came from the rule of the synagogue's house and said, Your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the rule of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Only believe. Charles believed Jesus and his daughter lived. It's that simple. God's power is always present, but you must tap into it by faith. Last week, both sides of the room were healed. Two different people were just laying on the hands and prayed. Why? Because people on both sides of this room had faith to be healed, and they tapped into the healing power as they were prayed for with their faith. And that's why it worked. You know how you have switches in this room to turn the electricity on in this room? There's a switch. Switches. Keep the switch of faith always turned on. Never turn it off. I heard that Brother Hagen years ago. About the switch of faith. Always keep it on. Never turn it off. To keep it turned on, what must you do? You must keep yourself in God's Word and keep hearing the Word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hear by the Word of God. So you must keep yourself in the word, keep yourself in faith. And if you do that, it keeps the switch of faith turned on. If you take additional time to completely heal when a sickness or disease has been present, this hot type of healing will take place later after the person has been prayed for or has received their healing. I gave that example of a man in Russia. Sometimes the body needs to gain strength to be comforted, to be at peace for all body symptoms to function properly at times. And I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give what I said there, what I'm about to say here, I'm giving you some real meat you won't hear from most 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 preachers. I'm giving you the meat of the word right here. Just because there's still symptoms in someone's body doesn't mean you're not healed. Just because there's symptoms left in someone's body doesn't mean that they're not healed. You can be healed and still have the body showing symptoms because the body is adjusting to no disease being present. Eventually, the symptoms will be gone. We never know that time period, how long that will be. It can be minutes, days, weeks, months, hours. What's important is that the power of God went into the person's body and the disease departed. That's why when I pray for the sick, I make sure the presence 
of God that's on me goes into their body. Once it's in, I'm done. And if they still have symptoms, that's fine. Do we have anybody in the room today when you left her, you still had symptoms, but now they're gone from that from last week? Anybody like that here? Anthony is. Yeah. See? It wasn't until it manifested in some areas until you walked out of here. So just because there's still symptoms doesn't mean you're not healed. It means the disease is gone, but the symptoms haven't caught up with the body functions. And that will happen. If you're still manifesting some symptoms, if you leave still manifesting symptoms, simply say this, the healing power of God went to my body and it's complete what it has started. I am healed in Jesus' name. And repeat that as much as you have to. I mean, just keep repeating it. Just keep saying, the healing power of God went to my body. It is complete, it is completing what it has started. And I am healed in Jesus' name. I am healed in Jesus' name. By him strikes, I am healed. And don't come off of that. You keep doing that, you're going to see the fullness of it. It's going to fully manifest. Before we close it, is there another testament I want to give you? Let me say a few more things. We're going to still close. I had a woman in a nursing home in Colby, Kansas. I was a head baseball coach. And I went back there for a revival. And, and the pastor, at, at the last day of the revival, was on Sunday. He said, do you mind going to the nursing home with me? It's my turn. They, the pastors of the town take turns going to the nursing home and minister to the people. I said, it's my week to go to the nursing home. I said, no, I'm glad to. He said, I want you to preach. I said, okay. I said, welcome to this fellowship hall. There's probably, oh, 35, 40 people in wheelchairs. And I'm preaching on healing. Mm -hmm. And uh, give a salvation call. I get a lot of, a lot, a lot of them get saved. And, uh, and I, it's time for the healing part. I'd come and, and it's time to pray for the sick and, and to be healed. And we did. We started seeing miracles happen. There was a wheelchair. I came this one lady. Last lady I prayed for. I asked her what was wrong. She told me what was wrong with her legs. She's been confined to her over 20 years. And I prayed for her, and the power of God went out of me into her so strongly. Her body started shaking violently. And she looked at me, and I looked at her and said, rise up and walk. And she started to get up. And when she started to get up, she saw her legs straighten up. She started standing, and she looked down. She looked at me, and fear came across her face, and she sat back down. I said, no, stand up. You can, you can walk out of that wheelchair right now. Come on, stand up. She refused to. She put her hands on both sides and that like she was gripping it over the death grip. I'm not moving. No, no, no. I said, don't lose your healing. Come on, you know you walk out of the chair. I know and you know it. God knows it. Walk. No, I'm not walking. She refused to. And I got upset. I said, you want to stay in that wheelchair? She said, I'm not getting up. I refuse to. I went back to the pastor. He closed the service. And uh, I was, I wasn't happy. She knew, God knew, and I knew she could walk out of that wheelchair. So when we left, went, got, went, got something to eat, went back to the pastor's house, and, and then later I was by myself in the hotel. Lord, what just happened? He said, Jerry, you don't understand. And I said, I know I don't understand. Why would anybody want to stay in a wheelchair? He said, if she walks out of the wheelchair, what you don't know is she has to leave where she's at. Yes. She has no family. Mm -hmm. She has no friends in town. Mm -hmm. She's outlived all of them. Exactly. She has no means financially to support herself. If she walks, she has to leave and has nowhere to go. She's stranded out on the street. And he said, she knows she's healed. And he said, I will tell you now and confirm it later to you. When she goes back to the nursing home mm -hmm. and she's by herself in the days ahead, she will walk around her room. She'll walk up and down the hallway when no one's watching. She's healed. But she knows that the nursing home has become her home. And she can't walk away from her home. Mm -hmm. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I said, no. That's why she couldn't get out publicly in front of everybody. They would know and they boot her out. She remember who else was in the room with you besides ones in the wheelchairs? I said, yeah, some administrators. They had been the first to make her go because they would they, they would have said, you don't need to be here because you can walk. I said, man, you are so loving. Here I'm mad at her. He said, that's because you don't see what I see. You're not all knowing like I am. 
He said, I said, I know, because I knew her. God went inside her, and she stood, and she knew it. And he said, yeah, she, she will walk. A couple months later, he told me, she's walking today. I said, what? The lady told me she's walking today. She walked in the hallways today. That's all I needed to hear. So just because you don't see it initially doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Even someone can refuse. Maybe there's a condition why they're refusing. The good news is, private is when she's been walking. I think she walked the rest of her life when she could. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah. Healing is based on two conditions. We bring this to a close today. The degree of healing power that was administered. Healing is based on two things. Number one, the degree of healing power that was administered by the person. Number two, the degree of faith that gives action to the power administered. So me or Pastor Camber, you lay hands on somebody, the amount of power that is transmitted out of you to that person you're praying for, and the degree of faith they have will determine if they're healed or not. And that's good to know that these are the two things, the only two things that you need to understand. It makes, it makes administering and healing people easy, not hard. See, most people wait for God to do something. No. We do something by faith. And then God always responds to faith. Are you hearing me? Amen. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. My son or daughter, the son is the word for humanity. Give attention to my words. Give attention to what? My words. Where are his words at? Two places. The Bible is a written word. And the Holy Spirit can bring you the spoken word. So give attention to the Bible, give attention to the spoken word of God. The rhema means the spoken word, the rhema word. Incline your ear to my sayings, to what Jesus, what God says. Do not let them part from your eyes. Are you hearing me? When people don't come to church, they're letting what? The word depart from their eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. That means in the midst of your spirit. For they are life to those that find them. They're what? Life, life to them that find them. And health to how much of your flesh? All. All your flesh. So if you get a bad diagnosis from a doctor, if you give attention to his word, if they tell you you're going to die in a couple of days, incline your ear to his hands. If you do not let them part from your eyes, if you keep them in the midst of your spirit, your heart, they're going to be life to you. You're going to find them, and you're going to have health, all that flesh that says it's going to die. That dying flesh will now live and not die. Are you hearing me? See, I can have faith for you, but if you don't have faith for yourself, you're not going to receive it. You have to have faith yourself. And there's a lot of churches that don't believe in healing. They don't believe Jesus is a healer. And there's a lot of Christians that don't know Jesus is a healer. And they die sometimes before the time because of that. You're guaranteed long life of this verse alone. And there's other verses that support that's living to be 60, 80 years old or until you're satisfied. Kim says she's living to be 120. <laughs> but she said. As a kid, he's always said 120. So Brother Copeland said that the other day. He's going to be 120. I told her. A, nah, listen, nah, nah, listen, I told her. You probably be by yourself. Because if I'm 120, and if, if that means wrinkles, I don't want the wrinkles of 120. I don't want, I don't want my wrinkles to have wrinkles. And then she's, I think she's thinking, well, you have much faith. You ought to have faith at 120. You have no wrinkles, right? Yeah. yeah there you go. Right. So a guaranteed long life is worth so long. Stand on it, do it, receive the benefits from it. All right? Mm -hmm. If you do that, you'll get the benefits from it. Amen. Next week, we're going to talk about the healing power of God and the anointing in relationship to this, how you can write your own ticket with God, how you can determine your outcome with God yourself. Those of you watching today by video, website, YouTube, thank you for joining us. Never forget that Jesus is Lord, but he's also the healer. Jesus is your healer. Give him the word, believe God, and receive your healing now. In Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you next week.